reading from the letter to the Hebrews. In the days when Christ was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Verbum Domini. Save me, O Lord, in your kindness. Save me, O Lord, in your kindness. In you, O Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your justice, rescue me. Make haste to deliver me. Be my rock of refuge, a stronghold to give me safety. You are my rock and my fortress. For your name's sake, you will lead and guide me. You will free me from the snare they set for me, for you are my refuge. And to your hands I commend my spirit. You will redeem me, O Lord, O faithful God. But my trust is in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. In your hands is my destiny. Rescue me from the clutches of my enemies and my persecutors. How great is your goodness, O Lord, which you have in store for those who fear you, and which toward those who take refuge in you, you show in the sight of the children of men. Dominus Fabiscum, et cum spiritu tuo, Lexio Sante Evangelii Segundum Lucam, Glory ad Ibidum Domine. Jesus' mother and father were amazed at what was said about him, and Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rise of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be contradicted, and you yourself a sword will pierce, so that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Verbum Domini. Peace be with you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. I am Father Stephen Imbarato of Priest for Life. I'm co-host of the Priest for Life EWTN show, uh, Defending Life. And I'm here this week with my co-host, uh, Janet Marana, uh, to tape another season. And Father Frank Pavone, of course, the national director of Priest for Life, extends his greetings. So let's deal with something, I think, very important from the first reading. Let's get this right out of the way. First reading, Hebrews 5, verse 9. When he suffered, Christ became the source of salvation for everyone who has faith, 
believes? No, obeys. When he suffered, Christ became the source of salvation for everyone who obeys. Now, my brothers and sisters in Christ, I have a great devotion to Our Lady of Sorrows, and today I'm not going to talk about Our Lady's traditional sorrows. I'm going to talk about what I believe is Mary, our mother's sorrow over what is happening in our country. And regardless of our personal devotion, whether it be a devotion to Our Lady of America or the Immaculate Conception as the patroness of our country or Our Lady of Guadalupe as the patroness of the Americas, Mary is our mother, Mary is the mother of the church, and Mary is the mother of our nation. And I'm sure we all suspect that Mary is sorrowful about what's happening in our country. The attacks on life, the attacks on marriage, the attacks on family, the attacks on religious freedom. We see it, I mean, coming at a rapid pace and getting worse and worse and worse. Now, my brothers and sisters, I am blessed to be part of two significant prayer efforts as we speak. Priest for Life is sponsoring a nine-week novena for our nation's election. It just started last week. It'll extend all the way to Election Day. It's a single prayer, a powerful prayer. You can find it at prayercampaign.com, prayercampaign.org. Both of those will bring you to the same place. I encourage you to pray this prayer each and every day between now and Election Day. And Father Joseph, when we got here on Monday, I can celebrate Monday's Mass. Father Joseph gave a beautiful homily about the Blessed Mother on the Feast of Our Most Holy Name and talked about the 54-day novena and the rosary rally in Washington, D.C. And of course, this is another powerful prayer effort, and I am blessed to also be a part of that. I am on the organizing committee for that 54-day novena, and in particular, for the rosary rally on the feast of Our Lady of the Rosary, October 7th in Washington, D.C. Myself, Father Rick Heilman, Heilman, who is part of the Holy League that Father spoke about. Doug Barry, who I'm sure you're all familiar with. He is also uh, from EWTN, part of the family. And then many, many others. And at noontime on October 7th, at the reflecting pool at the U.S. Capitol, we are going to pray for the conversion of our country on the Feast of the Holy Rosary. So I encourage uh, anyone who uh, can make it there, especially those in Virginia, Maryland, please try and come to this significant event. Let us pray for the conversion of our nation in our nation's capital, at our nation's capital. And the rosaries will be dedicated to the conversion of our country, and then each of the mysteries will be towards life. I'll be leading the life uh, mysteries, and then family, marriage, and religious freedom. Now, my brothers and sisters in Christ, and you can go to novenaforournation.com for any information about uh, the rosary rally. So as I said, I'm sure Mary is uh, sorrowful about many things in our country, but I dare say that if we really reflect on the feast, uh, on the, uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe, the lady who is bearing the child who ruled the world with an iron rod in Revelation chapter 12, Mary is no more sorrowful than she is over preborn child killing in this country. And in every abortion, every single abortion, at least one baby dies, a woman is wounded, a man is wounded, and a man is involved. A man is involved. And there's different scenarios that we deal with in terms of the man's relationship with the woman who has an abortion. I have had many men come to me and say, Father, you know, my girlfriend or my uh, wife, she had an abortion. I didn't even find out about it until after the fact. And I hear this many times. But as a percentage of all the abortions, that scenario really is a very low percent. I have other men who come to me and say, Father, I had my wife, my girlfriend, she wanted to have an abortion. I objected. I wanted to have the baby, and she went and had the abortion anyway. And I hear it many times, but again, as a percentage of the whole, it's a very small percent. 
I've stood in front of abortion mills and seen men drag their wife or their girlfriend or their victim into abortion mills, physically force them to have abortions. I've seen it many times over the years. But as a percentage of the whole, it's still a very small percent. The overwhelming majority of abortions is a scenario that I call the Adam scenario. And it is what I did to my Eve decades ago. If we look at the scene of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Paradise, we know the serpent comes in to test Eve, to tempt Eve, to confuse Eve. And in that passage, later on, it says her husband was there. So Adam was there. So as this dialogue is going on between Adam and the serpent, I mean, between Eve and the serpent, what does Adam do? At no time does Adam say, come on, Eve, let's get out of here. Eve, don't listen to him. He doesn't take Eve by the arm, drag her away. He doesn't step on the serpent's head. He doesn't say, get behind me, Satan. He does none of those things. And of course, women are intuitive. Eve is intuitive, probably looking to Adam for counsel. Adam's not saying anything, probably going like this. Eve takes that as tacit approval, and then she eats the fruit. Now, I personally believe the possibility, considering Adam's conduct, especially after this happens, that very possibly Adam was standing there watching to see if Eve dies after she eats the fruit. And when then Eve didn't die, I think Adam might have said, give me some of that fruit. Eve gives Adam the fruit, and they go into hiding. God comes looking for them. Adam, Adam, where are you? We're hiding. Why are you hiding? We were naked. Who told you we were naked? Oh, you ate of the fruit. Now, at that point, what does Adam do? What does Adam do? Now, Adam, in my mind, could have completely avoided the near occasion of sin, could have completely saved Eve, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, protected Eve, taken Eve out of there, in my mind, Adam was responsible for protecting Eve, standing up for Eve, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. And what does Adam do? There's three beings in paradise. There is the supreme being, the creator God, Adam and Eve. And Adam says, the woman you sent me gave me the fruit to eat. Adam blames God and Eve what he was responsible for. You know, my brothers and sisters in Christ, this is what I did to my Eve. And this is what many, in most abortion scenarios, what men do to women. They don't stand up for their women. They say, hey, I'll support you in whatever decision you make. And then, as I did, convince them really why they should have the abortion so that after the fact, they can wash their hands and not take responsibility. Oh, no, it was her choice. It was her choice. And we as men need to stand up and be men. We need to act responsibly. We need to be accountable if we wound women. We need to stand up for our women. Men often get wounded by abortions, but in most scenarios, women are wounded because men are like Adam was with Eve. This is the way I was. And as much as we went to confession fairly quickly after the abortion, we were away from the sacraments, came back to the sacraments after confession for a while. It wasn't until decades later that I realized that I was that man. I was Adam, and I went and I apologized, looked my girlfriend up from, many, from decades before. Wed. These were decades before I was a priest. And that's when I found out that the abortion cost two lives because I found out it was twins. And we named our children Thomas and Mary. Of course, Mary after the Blessed Mother, Thomas after St. Thomas Aquinas. You know, my brothers and sisters in Christ, one of the things that we can do to end preborn child killing is to be really sensitive about how many people are wounded in our culture directly from abortion. The numbers are correct. The percentage is maybe 20, 30% of all women and men have been wounded by abortion directly from abortion. We need to be attentive to people acting out, whether it be high-risk behavior, 
whether it be depression. I've learned over the years studying a Dr. Ney from Canada or Teresa Burke and studying uh, about survivors and, and of course Silent No More and Rachel's Vineyard to ask questions when I see someone depressed, when I see someone acting out. And of course I give my witness all the time, but I ask them, have you been a victim of sexual or physical abuse or have you been affected by abortion in your lives? And so let us be attentive, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Let us reach out to the wounded, be sensitive about how extensive the woundedness is in our country. Now, my brothers and sisters in Christ, people come to me all the time and say, Father, what, what can we do to end preborn child killing? And this is exactly what's going on in our country. The word abortion has been sterilized. It is preborn child killing. Well, Father Frank, in his last book, Abolishing Abortion, in chapter 3, writes that ending preborn child killing starts with personal repentance, personal conversion. I've always preached that. I believe that to be true. That's how my pro-life activism started when I repented from my complicity in an abortion. And so personal repentance. And then after the personal repentance, I tell people three things. First of all, pray. But not just pray, but pray inconveniently. Pray the novena for the election, right, that I held up the card. Praying for nine weeks straight, single prayer, it's inconvenient. Praying the 54-day novena, going to Washington, D.C., to the rosary rally, inconvenient, yes. 40 days for life. Spend time in front of the abortion mill. There's no place more inconvenient to pray than in front of an abortion mill. Pray at inconvenient times and inconvenient places. Now, why pray inconveniently? Because my brothers and sisters in Christ, abortion is the ultimate sin of convenience. What did St. Mother Teresa say? It is a poverty. It is poor. It's sad that a baby must die so that we can live as we want, so we can have the convenience of, conveniences of our lives, so our lives are not disrupted. Of course, we're called to sacrifice for our children. Our culture is sacrificing our children. So not just pray, but pray inconveniently to offset the ultimate sin of convenience, which is abortion. And then fast. Because fast is about inconveniences. Fast is about detaching from the things of this life. Not just fasting from food, but fasting from anything that might attach us to the things of this world. And again, it's a way of doing reparation for the cultural sin, the cultural convenient sin of abortion. And then, my brothers and sisters in Christ, alms, giving alms. Crucifix, my brothers and sisters in Christ, is the ultimate giving of alms. We hear in scripture that alms giving erases a multitude of sins. The ultimate sacrifice for our sins, for the sins of man. The most innocent blood ever shed, and thus, in these abortion mills, in these killing centers, these modern day Calvaries as I call them, we go and we stand and witness against the shedding of the most innocent blood of our culture. Pouring ourselves out, laying down our lives as Christ laid down his life for us. Almsgiving doesn't just mean right, giving money, time, talent, pouring ourselves out and doing so in reparation for the sacrifice of our children, the sins of our culture. Finally, my brothers and sisters in Christ, beyond these three things that we can do, again, it starts with a personal conversion, a personal repentance. And so, here's what I want to leave you with. Reflecting on the need for personal repentance, reflecting on the need for daily conversion. As Catholics, 
we should wake up each and every day and say, Lord, what more can I do to unite myself to you on the cross? As people of life, we should wake up each and every day and say, Lord, what more can I do to save a baby's life? A lady of sorrows, intercede for us.